if, if, if you were to know this, this has been shown to uh, improve error rates. So there was a study recently uh, from folks at Harvard and MIT where they simulated this human and machine partnership where they had essentially an expert and then a machine learning system and simulated that if you knew who to choose, who was making the right decision, and followed that decision, then you would reduce the error rate as much as 85%. Right, so this is for a specific case of um, identifying metastatic breast cancer. But you know, the trick is like, how do you, how do you know, right? In this case, it was simulated so they could tell who was making the right decision. So how do you know this in, in practice? So these are really just like the, all the open questions we've been trying to ask about um, how we can ground, like Vera said, you know, this is really about grounding communication in common and mismatched perceptions to help people determine who to trust uh, and when to, sorry, when to trust AI systems. So one thought is like maybe just educating users, just making them aware that there are these mismatches. Can, can that help people? So for example, um, Semi-autonomous vehicles um, oftentimes are optimized for uh, detecting moving objects, so moving vehicles, uh, while ignoring stationary ones. Um, and that has led to, to injuries and accidents. So for example, when there was a stopped, the uh, fire truck stopped in the road, that has caused problems with semi-autonomous vehicles. So you know, if people just were aware that, that these systems can't detect um, stationary objects, maybe just that awareness would make them more attentive, um, particularly if they're seeing stationary objects in the road. Can that help? Um, and if, if not, you know, how do you like, convey, if that's not enough, how do you convey mismatches? So we see this a lot um, you know, in, in visual kind of systems where uh, you can overlay um, what the AI might be detecting um, in the visual field so the user can sort of see what the system can see and what it can't see. Um, but you know, how do you do this across different modalities, right? So um, through when you're when you're working with sound or you know um, voice. So for example, Alexa. There's a recent example where Alexa started laughing at people randomly, um, and they tried to figure out why. And the reason was that it was perceiving sounds that were not audible to users, right? So that's that's frustrating to people because they don't know why it's happening, but the machine is detecting something. Um, so there's that mismatch. Um, so you know this requires you know understanding how to characterize perceptive capabilities of the machine, and then how do you convey that difference, those differences to people? Um, and then some other challenges um, include how do you convey these mismatches in time to intervene? You know, um, again with self threat semi-autonomous vehicles. You know, you have to make split-second decisions, so you don't have a lot of time to provide detailed explanations. Um, but if you could quickly um, overlay information in the visual field or to convey mismatches, maybe that could help. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe even then, it's like you know, you have to make it in, in just like less than a second. You have to make a decision. So how do you do that? Um, other challenges are how do we handle changes over time? So I find this very interesting. Um, you know, because one of the main benefits of AI systems are their ability to learn over time. Um, but it can also be problematic if uh, people start to expect certain behaviors from certain populations and then that changes. Um, so even if your the accuracy of your AI improves overall, it might actually get worse in some scenarios and better in others. So if, for example, you have a doctor believing that an AI does or does not work for a certain populations, so maybe you know, children, for example. Well, hey, this hasn't worked very well in the past, so I'm not going to trust it. But there's a model update then, and now it's working better. How do you convey that so that they understand that the you know the system has improved, um, or you know, vice versa? If it's gotten worse, how do you how do you inform that that their you know expectations should be updated? Uh, and then finally, you know, we're thinking: are there, are there ways that we can you know employ AIs to help with this? Like, Meta AI. So, you know, going back to this, uh, you know, image. If so, so imagine um, a doctor is interacting with a patient and is making decisions um, for certain classes of people. So, so children again. You know, uh, a doctor might be um, making decisions based on demographics of, of their patient, along with the interaction with them. And to the AI, the only shared um, shared uh, 
attributes are the demographic information. So maybe to the AI, the doctor might be um, behaving uh, inconsistently, right, for, for, for that population of users because the, the AI can't see that the doctor is making uh, decisions based also on the interaction with the patient. So can we use that, the sort of having the AI detect when inconsistencies in, in certain populations, can that help us detect when you should be trusting one partner versus another? Um, That's just some early thinking we've been doing around how to help with this problem. But you know, we really think there's a rich space of interesting questions here um, that you know we want to start to explore. So to summarize, you know, there's fundamental mismatches in how humans and machines perceive and reason about the world that can have some benefits, but also some potential limitations. Can grounded communications in these common perceptions help? There are many open questions. So thanks. Maybe while Salima takes some questions, Kevin can come up and get his slides ready. Is Kevin here? Is Kevin here? No. No? All right. Well, I guess uh, we'll have you take some questions okay. and then maybe have the sure. two of you in conversation. So, um, anyone have a starting question? Yes. I, I, I think this, this thing is really interesting because if you re replace AI in your lives with statistics, you still have this, the same issues of understanding. But you don't have the issue of trust. But people have been trusting statistics without knowing what statistics is for <laughs> decades. And decisions have been made on statistics, all kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. why, do we, why, is, why do we think we have this difference? You know, I think there are a lot of, I think people have, you know, they have sometimes unrealistic expectations of AI systems. You know, they often think these things are kind of magic. And that's partly, I think due to how they're portrayed in the media and, all their, their, and also the lack of knowledge of how these things work. So I think a lot of that has something to do with it. Uh, and in fact, Rafal is a, a coach elder. He's, he's presenting a paper on setting expectations uh, on Tuesday, um, trying to sort of understand how we can adjust those expectations so that when they're going in to the it's an interaction that maybe people have more realistic expectations and then that might you know, adjust how much they trust. Talking about the mismatches between the human decision and the AI decision in, in most cases, but communicating this mismatch at the time of operation to the human users. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the fundamental problem that I see with that is when, when this is happening, you do not necessarily know that there is a mismatch. So yeah. are you are you actually talking about like the communicating that this is a fuzzy decision, this is this is inference rather than a decision? Is that what you're actually talking about, or is it something I think, right, there's that, that the, that the machine is, is maybe operating under uncertainty, so it's a fuzzy decision, but it's also operating under a different feature space, right? So it's using different data than you have access to, and that's part of the problem, right? The fact that it can see these things that you can't um, sometimes causes people to overtrust, but if you realize that you also have information that the machine can't see, then you know maybe that will adjust how, how much you trust those systems. Right? So it's both about um, explaining sort of the decision at the time, but also what information it's operating over. So it's not so much about where the decision is coming from. Yeah, or what's influencing the decision. Okay. Yep. Uh, really nice talk. I like this setup. This reminds me of uh, a classical problem in philosophy of mind. It's called a problem of the other mind, right? So in, the, in these perceptual differences, uh, you're almost trying to approximate a little theory of the other mind. Yeah. So I'm curious to know like, how, in your opinion, or maybe if you have given any thoughts on, uh, how do we operationalize that? Like, because conceptually, I think it totally makes sense, but then when I'm thinking of like, how do I go about reviewing these misalignments, how these misalignments evolve over time. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, yep, <laughs> those are all questions that you know are open to us. You know, I think this goes to the theory that Vera was talking about. You know, can we leverage some 
theory and, and work that's been done and how people with different perspectives establish common ground. You know, I think part of it is just awareness, but then there's also you know, conveying that in some way. Um, may, like, I think maybe people do this grounding through dialogue with each other so they can understand. So maybe that's, how do you, how do, you do that with a human and an AI system? Um, so I think maybe you know, understanding more how people do this can, can help. Yeah. I was wondering if you uh, explored the question also of responsibility of uh, the ultimate decision. So let's say uh, if an AI system makes a decision and the uh, human overrides the decision, but that was actually a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what are the consequences then in future on future decisions? Would, for example, a doctor um, who makes a wrong decision and the AI made the correct decision, but the doctor overrode that decision, uh, would the public have access to the process, right? So would the, the, the people know, the patient know, well, the uh, machine said, made the correct prediction, the correct decision, but the doctor overrode that. Uh, what are the consequences of, of, of these issues? I don't know if you had some thought about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a huge problem with accountability. Um, you know, we've been, as we've been thinking about this problem um, and like how we would test whether perceptions that people have are, are understanding these mismatches, we've been talking about um, measuring the performance of the team, so the computer and the AI together as opposed to just one. Um, and maybe that's the way to look at it, right? Because sure, in, in specific scenarios, one may have made the right decision and the other might not have, but overall is the partnership, um, you know, performing well. Might be one way to think about it. Yeah. Have you thought about how you would like operationalize that? Like how do you get the external signal about what's what's the truth or what's the truth? Or, yeah. Do you is it like like a quality assurance program with sampling or because that's what I'm yeah. kind of investigating, but I don't know whether that's the best way to go. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably scenario dependent, you know, like think of the medical decisions. How do you know, like, I mean, you know if the patient was cured, right? Um, but like in other scenarios, you can you know, see whether, you know, like quit them immediately if the, if the decision was correct. So, so it might be scenario dependent. Um, but yeah, I don't have the answer. It's an interesting setup well, which may occur. This seems to be described as a world where you don't have a say as to what the system is able to perceive, right? Mm -hmm. You're being given a black box and you don't you cannot change that. But there may be others in which you may influence that in order to increase trust. Mm -hmm. If the machine is not seeing this, if it were to see that, I will trust it more. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I wonder your thoughts around that uh, interactivity. Yeah, um yeah, that's interesting. We, we haven't thought about it in that sort of, if you had the ability to teach it as you go. Um, but I think that's that's critical. And in fact, it helps, or I mean, that's really interesting. I think it helps particularly as the, the changes over time. So like, so often these systems can be updated by an external person based on data that they're collecting over time. So then you're not updated or aware of how, it's, how the model might change. But if you're doing the changing and doing the teaching, maybe that would you know help with that problem so now you can understand when to trust it more and when not. Yep. Um, I have a question from for both of you. I think in your talk there is a premise that there is something to learn from AI for the professionals, either doctors or judges, and they should eventually trust it when they should trust it. <laughs> um, but, but I guess the SEW looks at it in a different way. Everyone is kind of equal. I can choose to trust you, I cannot. <laughs> and you don't always need to explain to me what's your intention. And there is this difference between motivation and behavior. So I guess I'm wondering what's your take on this relationship? Is there a such a sort of underlying relationship between AI and human over it? We also know it's just not explicit yet. Well, I mean, right, so we don't really necessarily expect everyone to explain all their, like people to explain their decisions as much as we expect AIs to. Uh, but part of that, I think, is because when we interact with people, we, we start to form mental models about how, how they're making their decisions through our interactions. 
you know, like, I think about, you know, like, my husband, like, I trust my husband and everything except for his, you know, recommendations in movies, right? <laughs> like, and that's because you know, over time, I've, you know, I recommend movies that I don't really like, right? So that's like, I don't need him to explain, but I know that, you know, I won't trust his recommendations so much for that, right? So I think, um, the person, at least for perceptual mismatches, like sort of if you understand like when maybe to trust and when to not, and maybe that's through experience, then you don't necessarily have to give those explanations. But you know, oftentimes we don't necessarily get that time to make um, to gain that experience. I don't know. Um, another point about trust is also trust is uh, experienced. So as the human interact with the system, then they will. As they are from the mental model, and another important thing is also uh, from a system perspective, how do you accurately communicate the level of performance to the user? Right, that goes back to as I mentioned, social transmission theory. It's not just about uh, showing what I know, but also aware how you see me and how I should react. So, if I'm a system, uh, maybe be aware whether the user might be over trusting me or under trusting me. How do I adjust my behavior based on that? Maybe something we can. Um, so one thing that we have been uh, looking at is trust calibration as a process rather than uh, trust building as like one thing that you do uh, at the beginning or at the end of, of a process. Um, so I was wondering what your take is on having this whole mechanism um, being um, a give and take um, as a continuous process. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's critical for any particularly because they can change over time. So you, you should be constantly sort of um, calibrating, well maybe not constantly, at least like as the, as the model might update. You want, you, you know, it, 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 depending on how, how you're gonna commute, um, collaborate with the machine over time. Um, if it's just a one-off, then maybe like up front is just enough, but if you're gonna be interacting as a partner with this, this system over time, then yeah, you wanna keep updating it. That's the way to do it. Society, you're going to talk about agreement. I mean, society can disagree about a lot of things. And I'm thinking what are the implications of having a collective of people trying to create a system where contradictions are part of, of that, of that, you know, um, would a system that is also is not consistent in, it, in its judgment, would that be a, a desirable outcome? I'm not even sure how to properly think about that scenario. Multiple sources of truth should coexist. Right, that's a, that's a really interesting point. Um, I think we can learn from how human engage in conflict resolution. I guess a lot of time conflict arise also is because of lack of mutual understanding. So how do we communicate that understanding? How do we communicate position of the model? Uh, would be interesting, and also that's not just in this process of development, maybe the model of making errors, uh, but also uh, in some situation, maybe uh, the model, I guess a lot of time model, uh, in decision making context, for example, <coughs> the model will have certain advantage, right? How do we communicate to that? Um, I think there is a paper on Tuesday, uh, <coughs> talking about how do we draw from human reasoning theory and think about uh, the human biases and then how do we use this machine learning process to also counter the kind of biases, that's especially in the uh, context of decision support. So I think that's really important and interesting direction. I don't have a clear answer how that will uh, form in the future, but I think there's also definitely opportunity for machine to counter biases of people and you, using the kind of process of uh, how you machine make a decision. Respect. <laughs> 
that a human has towards a machine is very different from a human human um, kind of the social dynamic. And I'm wondering how that plays into your, uh, when you're comparing those two frameworks. Uh, yeah. Right, so that's the part I don't have a very good answer. Um, I think um, we will definitely not treat machine as always as an equal member, uh, but how that will empirically arise in the kind of mechanism, in the kind of patterns, um, we don't know yet. But I think uh, it also how we see the partner, how we react in interaction, again, that's an experience process that depends, that's context dependent, and also depends what's the intelligent level of the machine, um, how, how what is our prior experience. That's interesting thing to study. I think there are some work, for example, looking at more uh, field study of uh, how can they interact with bots and how that thing. So this kind of uh, empirical study in the field will be really important to understand. Yeah. I have a bit of a follow up on your question. So I think in terms of kind of risk entity, there are things between people like a hierarchy of like you have a boss versus employees that is some might be an interesting conversation. I think there are different also, if you look at different cultures, there are cultures in which these are quite strong things, like Western cultures are very more open and more equal. But anyway, that's something interesting to look at. But the question I actually have um, is related a bit to kind of communicating in a, in a parallel space that would be I think, uh, and probably there's no answer to this, but uh, I think when we communicate with people, there's some perception of like, level of understanding of the world. Like you know, you know the this kind of person is a chair or it's like all these things. But I'm curious to have the specific AI specific areas and there are these things about talking AI and you change the image slightly and it completely looks completely different like that. But curious how what's the level of assumptions uh, you can carry from communication with human the AI even the AI can make mistakes that It might be interesting to go back to look at the, the, uh, the grounding theories. Um, the grounding theory, one of the core idea is also um, the, the exhibition of evidence, right? So during the process, you should always try to signal if you see this misunderstanding, if there's a breakdown. But from the speaker's point of view, you also constantly assess whether there is a mutual understanding, whether there is a uh, theory is not happening. Um, but whether you will start a grounding process, whether you will try to correct, that is also a dynamic discussion. That is also a dynamic decision. So there are a lot of work uh, on the theory perspective, how do we determine the timing or determine the kind of uh, grounding I'm going to engage in. And there is uh, work on, for example, theoretical uh, framework, how do, you, uh, how do you to determine that kind of process. So again, when we think about arrow, I think about debugging uh, Maybe that's another uh, sort of decision theoretical framework. Uh, can we can we accurately predict if there's an error? Can we can this particular debugging uh, action correct that kind of error? That's also from the uh, developer side. That's going to be uh, assessed when they come to the engagement. But how do we assess that kind of cost? How do we assess that kind of benefit? I don't have a, I don't have a I'm going to step in and use chair's privilege to ask one last question. So my question for both of you is, you know, both of you have raised really important questions um, and provided frameworks to start thinking about questions that others in this community and the AI and ML communities are thinking about. Um, what is one thing that you would like to see happen or one hope that you have um, to see in the HDI community or the ML community or an industry that would um, help drive this work forward in a useful way? I mean, I, I would say I would, for especially for the human AI collaboration part, I, I think going to the theories and looking at how people col um, collaborate and coordinate, I think that we can draw a lot from that potentially without having to like reinvent everything. So I would hope to see more of that. Um, I think 
that's something also a lot of people ask today is where the breakdown happens. Um, I think there are many times I ask like people working on human communication theories, um, is there a kind of principled way we can predict where the breakdown might happen, but I haven't got any answers yet. I think there's important question from a theory perspective. How do we predict that kind of breakdown? How do we um, transfer the kind of theory in the human domain to human machine system that will uh, need a lot of empirical work and also a lot of theoretical?